Hi, everybody. I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy reference specialist at the Maine State Library. And today I'm, first of all, I'm my new office with the library moving. We haven't moved the collections yet. We're not open to the public yet. I don't have a date on that, so don't ask me. Um, I will, you guys will know as soon as I do when we'll be open to the public again. Um, but today I'm going to talk a little bit about using the back end of Family Search. Um, family Search is the Family History Library's online portal. It's for those of you who don't know, it's the Mormon slash LDS um, library in Salt Lake City. And this is available for free if you sign up for a free account. Um, I have, will assure you, I have never gotten spam from them. You know, I get the usual, you know, if you start putting a tree in, you'll get the usual things about, um, you know, we found new records on your ancestor and such, but I, I've never gotten anything that wasn't related to family history from them. Because I always, every time I talk about you need a free account, people worry about that and no, they, I get, and I get less email from them than I get from my heritage or ancestry or find my past by a good bit. So let me start sharing my screen. Um, and I'm still getting set up here, so I definitely don't want you having to see me looking this way. Um, so this is, once you've created an account and you've signed in, this is what you'll see. I have this here um, that is, um, because I've put, I've attached myself to a tree. Now their family tree, unlike an ancestry where you have your own tree, the tree at family search it, they're attempting to do a, a one world tree. And so you don't create your own tree. You're tapping into what other people have done. And the good news on that is sometimes you find stuff that other people have found, um, photographs or records. Um, the downside is that if you put in correct information, if somebody has the wrong information, they can come in and overwrite it. Um, but you can watch the um, people you're interested in. But that's the easy stuff. Those are the things that are going to come up in a general search here. You'll notice when I go to the search tab, it gives me the option of looking at records, at the family or the family tree. And so these are similar, you know, at Ancestry, how you have the records and you have family trees, same thing here. But what I'm going to talk about today um, are these two, the catalog and the books, which overlap. Um, most of the books will be in the catalog, but you can search the books separately. I did do a program a couple weeks ago about the books, um, about digitized books and talked about that. So I'm not going to go into it in depth today. Um, I'm mostly going to talk about the catalog. And the reason for doing this is that let me first go in. If I go into search and records, you get an interface that looks very much like Ancestry or MyHeritage because there are only so many ways you can put together a search page for looking at records. And so if I put somebody's name in um, here, This will search the records that they've got, and you'll see that I'm getting the same sorts of things I'd get in Ancestry, census records. And over here, um, there are these three icons. This one means that there is a, this person's attached to a tree. This shows you the record details that have been transcribed. And this, tell, this one tells you that there is an image. 
So you'll get things, you'll see here, for example, that this is just an index only, and they don't have a digitized image linked to this index. They may have one in what I'm going to show you. And you'll notice if you click on the record detail, it will also take you and show you the original document if it's there. Um, they run on mostly on volunteer effort. Um, you know, they, FamilySearch pays a few specialists to oversee things and they pay their IT people for computer stuff, but most of their indexing and digitizing is done by volunteers. And one of the things that happens when you digitize records is it's a lot faster to digitize a, a roll of microfilm than it is to go back and index it. And so you get the situation where you get many, many records at Family Search that are not indexed, but the digitized microfilm is there. And so when we go into this searching and the catalog, so I went search and catalog. And here we have multiple options. So we can search by a place name, a family name, the title of a record, an author, and I'll show you why that's handy in a minute, in a few minutes, by subject, and these tend to be Library of Congress style classifications, and by keyword. You can also, if you have found a reference, say in a book or a magazine article, to a film number for Family Search, because um, many of you will have used Family History Centers where you've ordered microfilm back when they lent microfilm out, and you may have find you've got an old film number, you can search by the film number, which is very handy. Um, so let's start with searching by a place name. I'm going to actually open that up in a sec. Oh, it's not going to let me. So let's start with, let's start with Danvers, Massachusetts, where my mother's family was from. And I'm going to click here. And you'll see these are the records they've got that are, um, in some way related to Danvers. And so you have things like um, in the vital records, you can see we've got the births, deaths, and marriages. We've got the intentions of marriages. These, I'm sure some of you will notice these to the end of 1849. Those are what we call the TAN books. Those were the published vital records of Massachusetts that were done in the early 20th century. So let's take a look at this one. Now this has been indexed, you can see it here, but let's say you're pretty sure there should be a record there and it's not indexed and you wanna look at it. We can scroll down here and see that there are two films and this says you can search them, but it also, if I click on the camera, it takes me to this page that is literally the scanned microfilm. And I can double click on this and get original records. And you can sit here and scan through them just the way you would work through a microfilm. And you'll notice it's interesting, when these were printed in that tan book in the early 20th century, they alphabetized everything. But you'll notice these were actually, you have the name of the couple, and then you have all of their children. And you'll note here that obviously you have Lydia who born and died, and then it says the second Lydia. And so they actually kept track of um, this. And you'll also see that you can correlate. It's sometimes not easy in the printed vital records to know that this death record applies 
to the Lydia born on this date? Because if you have a fairly common name, does this go to this Lydia or her cousin or second cousin who's also Lydia Osborne and may have had parents with similar names and you don't know? Um, so it, I often, you know, Go back as far as you can, as close to you can as you can to the original record. Um, now, sometimes when and we'll go back to the catalog, and I'm going to search on Middleton, Mass. Oops, Middleton, Massachusetts, and we'll go here. And if I go into church records. Here's the local church for Middleton. And here's a little quirk. See this nice little key or not very nice little key over the camera? That means you need to be in a family history center at a, a LDS slash Mormon church or an affiliate library. And we are an affiliate library, although we're in the with moving, it's gonna be a couple months before you'll be able to use that. And you'll see we get this pop up that we can't see this. Um, but it'll tell you where you, you can go to see it. Um, and a lot of libraries are affiliates. So if you're looking for one, you can click there. And let's put in Augusta, Maine, and search. And so there it shows we're an affiliate library. And if we move out a bit, um, there is actually a, it's closed at the moment, which is why it's not showing up, but there is down here a, a Mormon church with a family history center. Um, you'll see the Camden library is an affiliate library. Here is a, this is a, this is a, um, um, a family history center in a Mormon church, you'll see their hours are, they've got five hours a week. Um, and that's if they have volunteers. And I don't know if the, any of, how many of those are open at the moment with, with the pandemic. Um, but we will be back in operation sometime, I hope. Um, but that, that just shows you if, if you're not here in Maine, and again, we can scroll out even further and you can see that there are several other, um, both the affiliate libraries and the family history centers. Um, but let's go back to searching. Let me go to the catalog again. And let's go back to Middleton. And if we go into, I think it's the town records. Again, these have been indexed, but you can go in. Now, one reason it's nice to be able to take a look at the film number, you'll see here that you've got this film number and it says items one and two. Um, if we take either this number or this number, both of them will work. So I'm gonna copy this number and go here, go back to the search page and hit film fiche, put that film number in and hit search. And it shows that this roll of microfilm that's digitized has these records on it. So um, this is less important now than when you were ordering microfilm to come in to see what was there. But sometimes it's nice to see, you know, are those items one and two of three? Or if you've got like item seven, is it the last one on the roll so you can scroll through and work your way back? Or is it item three of 21 short items and you're gonna have to sort of figure out where it is on the page? So let's take a look at tax valuations. Again, these have been indexed. Um, they're items five through nine. Um, so that's how you can use that film number. Or as I said, you know, if, if you have 
a reference in an article or something you had handwritten years ago, you can look and see what it is if you didn't write down what the exact thing was. So let's go back to the search results and go into, I think the church, yeah, the church records are, let's see, vital records. There was one of these that, um, again, that's been indexed. So let's go back and search the catalog again. And I'm gonna go for a different place. This is a place in Scotland where my grandmother was born. And again, you get the information um, and you get the church records and you will get some of these, again, th these are locked, but you'll notice, see this one has a, the little micro magnifying glass and this one doesn't. This means that this is indexed and you can click here to search it and it tells you what's on this one. But because this is just another filming of this, this one wasn't separately indexed. But if you get into this one and you can't read something, it's worth taking a look at this one to see if the, the filming was better. You know, they may have refilmed it before because they got it back to Salt Lake City and realized some pages were missing or that something didn't came out too dark and so on. So you, know, you would probably use this to find things and then this to look at it again if, if it was um, you had the uh, to look to see if you had a better look at it. So let's do another one. Let's look by surname. And um, this is name in my family history. Um, comes up with one thing. And this one, unfortunately, has not been microfilmed. But this is something where if I hadn't already found this, it tells me a couple things. One thing is it tells me that it's at the New Hampshire Historical Society in Concord, New Hampshire which if I were in a mood for a field trip is a one day trip, unlike going to Salt Lake City. Um, I've had things here you know, come up in, for some of the work I'm doing on my family in Pennsylvania. I know someone who lives a couple hours from a historical society in Pennsylvania and she's gone when she's been doing her research, done stuff for me and then I've done some things here in New England for her. The other thing is, since this is not digitized, you'll notice here, what happened when they stopped loaning out microfilm is they let local family history centers decide that they could keep the microfilms that were there rather than sending them back. And so you'll notice this is obviously in the Salt Lake City, but if I click here, Notice this is also, there's a copy of this microfilm at the Bangor Family History Center. So if I just wanted to be able to go somewhere in an afternoon, I could see when they're open and go look at it there. So if something's only on film, don't give up hope yet. Check where the record was originally because you may be able to go see it and check whether, and you'll see some of these make no sense at all. I mean, you know, why is um, the why does the Albany, Georgia Family History Center have this? Well, there's probably something on this film. And again, we'll go back here, and you can see this is a couple items. And we'll go back, and I'll open a new tab and search on this film number, and you'll see that unlike that other one that was all about Middleton, Massachusetts, look at, there are 23 different things on this, and it looks like it's, a, you know, it's all sorts of families. And so there's a good chance it, it was not my Restio family records that was the reason that people borrowed this, but the Ross family or the Robinson family 
and you can see they obviously just had stuff almost in alphabetical order because all of these families start with R. And so I'm guessing it was, you know, maybe it was this Brunswick family that's the reason it's at Bangor and it's one of these other families that's the reason it's at Albany, Georgia, is somebody had ordered the microfilm to those family history centers. So if you can't get to Salt Lake City and something's not digitized, check this out to see if it is at a family history center um, either near you or near someone you know. <laughs> I had one come up that the only place it was, it was in the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. It was in some Texas Family History Center and the Family History Center near where my brother was in DC, in, in the DC suburbs had it. And he knows nothing about genealogy, he doesn't care anything about it. But I did bribe him into going in and, and you know, saying, I don't know what I'm doing, but I printed this out. My sister needs a copy of it. Please volunteer here. Help me get the copy of this for my sister. So I get the bribe that she's promised me for getting this for her. So I just, I wanted to show you this because with things that haven't been digitized and with not all of us being able or wanting to make a trip to Salt Lake City. The other thing is, now this is just a manuscript. Sometimes this will be a book and you can also look in WorldCat. This um, only comes up for the Family History Library, but if we're looking at um, some of the other things on this film, you like one of those was a book um let's take a look at this one so no, that's another manuscript i guess none of these are actually books um these look like they're all manuscripts um but it would be worth checking this if it turns out it's a book to see if there is a library near you that has it so let's go back here um, to the catalog. Um, you can also search by keywords. So for example, if I want to find um, everything related to a, a parish or area in Yorkshire called Brig House, I can click here and it brings anything up where Brig House is here. Um, now, most of these are also going, if I go into, um, let's go into one of these. They're also going to have the subject headings, but these are basically based on, they're, they're controlled vocabulary. So if you don't enter one of these quite right, in the subject um, here, you know, if you put in Brig House, um, now in this case it worked, but sometimes it won't. Um, but this also then shows you, if you found something through the keyword, here are some of the related um, so we'll go into Brighouse Church Records, um, and you'll see we have um, these choices. Now let's take a look. Here are the parish registers for the Church of England. Again, here's one that's locked. You'd have to be in a family history library. Let's look and see. This is the, the Quaker meeting there. Again, I'm happening on these because I'm, I'm choosing these to show you. Lots of things are open. Um, here's the bishop's transcripts also locked. So let's find something else. Let's try, um, we'll go back to places. 
and we'll do Buffalo, New York, because that's one of the places I grew up. And we'll hit this. And you will see for a bigger city, there are lots of things here. Um, and you can go through and see what churches there are. So let's take a look at this Episcopal church. And you'll see, this has been somewhat indexed, but you can also just browse the images, which if you've got a difficult name, you know, you're sitting here going through and it's, you can page backwards and forwards. You can go in and out. If you want to go back to the multi-page view, because let's say you're figuring something, you can either scroll down with your mouse, or let's say I've looked at it and I realized that it's all one set of date records and it's um, all in alphabetical order and I'm looking for a family name that begin, begins with P, I could try putting in and hit enter and it takes me to image 888 and that way or things are so you know, date order alphabetical order you can go through this looks like these are in not sure what order these are in um looks like it's by the date of the baptism um and then the birth dates you can see vary considerably. But you know, if you know when somebody was baptized or about when they were, and let's say I was aiming for 1878, I could then just sort of page forward, or I could guess that maybe I want page 909, hit enter, and there's the list of confirmations. So you can play around with finding your way through a role. Um, Oh, let's, that's not what I wanted to do. I love the reopen close tab. If you right click on this in Chrome, if you right click on this plus, it gives you the reopen close tab. I can't tell you how often that saved me from um, accidentally closing something. So let's go back to the church records and let's see if I can find another one. Again, this is indexed and it's available. Um, there were a lot of Catholic churches in Buffalo. Um, and if you know your churches, like St. Stanislaus was heavily Polish. Um, Sacred Heart was, if I remember correctly, German, mostly German speakers. Um, and I think Annunciation was Polish and Irish. And there's a St. Andrews that's heavily Irish. Um, and so we can go here and take a look at this. And you'll see this one, much of it's in Latin. You know, I've done the program on reading things that you don't know. It gives you the dates of everything. Now notice here, there's no red text here saying it's been indexed. And there's no micro magnifying glass here. That means that the only way to access this record is to click here and scroll through the microfilm. There is no index to this. And so you just have to, um, now it looks like there's an index within the microfilm. So before they microfilmed this, it looks like you know, they've done a, a, a local index, which is helpful. Um, and when you get one of these longer, bigger data sets, it's always looking worth looking at both the beginning and the end of the microfilm to see if there is indeed one of these internal indexes. Um, so this will tell you, it looks like they have multiple volumes and then the page number. So if we want to go find, um, 
let's look for Edward Culver, volume one, page 271. So I'm gonna make a guess. Let's take a look. Let's go here. Um, this looks like it's volume one. So let's look here to check that. So this is the baptisms. And it's volume one. We're at page 90 or image 90 here. Let's take a look. The other thing to notice is they will tell you at the beginning um, if there are issues with when they microfilmed it. So this is book one and it looks like we're getting two pages. So page 270 divided is 135 plus 94. Let's aim for 225. And no, that only gets us up to page 150. My math is wrong. I went into library science because they told me there'd be no math. Um, Oh, I wonder if those numbers may actually be these and not a page number. That's a possibility. I think when they indexed it, it looks like instead of the page number. So let's actually go to page. No, that's not. So, where are we? So, is, nope, that's not, so I'm not quite sure. I have to pay, play around more with, um, oh, no, wait a minute. Look, here's, here's the Culver family. So there it is. So this is indexed by these numbers, not page numbers. And so you will, have to um, play around with. So that indexing, it looks like when they indexed it, they numbered, looks like each day's worth of baptisms because it looks like, um, oh no, it's each one. But here you have, um, you know, the baptized Edward, um, born the 18th of, I think that's March, um, Edward Culver and Maria Roach. Conj means, you know, that they're um, married as opposed to a, an illegitimate child. And then the sponsors were, looks like Irene Carolyn Culver and Helen Resch, or Roach. Um, both names were common in the area I grew up, so that would be something I'd want to look at. And then what's really nice on this is they came back um, when obviously checking that Edward Culver had been baptized before they married. And you can see that they come back and note when, when and where they got married. So nice Catholic record there for you. It's worth fighting through the Latin to get at that information. So you know, when, when you're doing these microfilms, you will have to figure out if there is that internal index, what, you know, obviously they're indexing by this number, not the page number. Um, and sometimes there's not that, and you will just have to sit here and go like this until you find what you're looking for. Um, but these are, um, and you'll notice to go back and forth in the um, in this book, I'm using this. But when I hit the browser back page, it takes it doesn't take into account those images. It takes me back to the page about the records. And this is nice. They do tell you most volumes include an index. 
Now on this one, the index was on the, in the, its own volume. And, but sometimes it'll be at the beginning of each volume. You know, there's no consistency. But you know, this is something, the only way you can get your hands on these records is either to go to that church in Buffalo and hope that the church secretary or the priest has the time to look up the record for you, um, which in many cases, older records have been sent to a diocesan archive and it's very hard to get a hold of them. Um, just because the, the diocese ha doesn't have a full-time archivist. Um, or you can do this. Um, but this is an excellent way to um, look by place and see what's there. So if we go back to the search results, we've got um, all of these churches in Buffalo. Now I'm going to go back to the place. So I want to show you one other thing. Um, let's go actually to Gala Shields. Actually, uh, sorry, let's, let's go to um, Montrose, P Pennsylvania, which is a place I've done some research. I had a family there, ancestors for about a generation and a half. Now, one of the things that's nice here is if you don't really know the geography of a place, you'll see these are the things specifically for the town of Montrose, but it tells you here it's part of Susquehanna County. And so I would wanna look at these lo this level records as well. And then at this point, you have a choice. You can either go up to Pennsylvania and look, at statewide records, or we can go back, oh, come on. We'll do it this way. If I click on places within Pennsylvania, it gives me a list of all the counties. I can click on Susquehanna. And again, here are the county level records. And if I click on this for places within Susquehanna County, these are all of the places in the county that they have records for. So if I know, for example, that in addition to Montrose, that my ancestors lived in Brooklyn Township, I can go and look and see there. And so it's, if you're poking around, you know, remember church records, you may have somebody who went to church in the town next to where they were, lived, and so those church records may not be in the town they lived in. So it would be worth looking to see, you know, so if, if Montrose didn't have a Presbyterian church, but Brooklyn did, they may have gone there. It may be that the church, there was a Presbyterian church in, in Montrose, but this family, the family I'm looking for went to the Brooklyn church because they were half a mile from there, whereas it was, two and a half miles up and downhill. This is a part of Pennsylvania. They call it the endless mountains. And so you know, you're more likely to go to the church half a mile away when it's either your own foot power or your horse than two and a half miles up and down um, hills in the winter. So I just wanted to show you that as well, that you can look around for places um, near where your ancestors lived as well to find church records or other things where you know it's worth looking at these now one of the other things i wanted to show you um before i go any further we're in susquehanna county let's go into the history and these are going to tend to be books um and so let me just show you if we click here. Um, this one is digitized. It's on microfilm. And this looks like it's a typescript. No, this is actually a printed book. And you can sit here and do this through the book. Um, 
the other thing I wanted to show you is if we go back to the search results, um, let's see, huh. let's see if this works. So here we have periodicals. This one is only available in the Family History Center. Um, which is a shame because they had some good information. Um, looking for one of these that will work. Um, here you have one where some of it's on microfilm and some of it's been digitized. Um, so that's an interesting bit. Um, so, but let's go back to the search page and by author. So let's try, and I'm doing this purposely, Maine State Archives. The State Archives let FamilySearch come in and do a lot of digitizing of their records. And so oh, anything that was digitized out of the Maine State Archives has that as the author. And you can see there are 182 of these. And so it's worth, if you're looking in Maine, taking a look and seeing what, you know, there's some interesting stuff that comes up um, from Connecticut and Boston. But you also get things here. Um, here's a, a court docket. Again, it's been digitized but not indexed. So the only way to look through this is to click here and work your way through it. Fortunately, this is a short one. Um, and as I said, that you also have digitized books. Um, actually, let me go back here and show you from here. So I'm gonna put in um, a surname, Sears. And let's see what comes up. Actually, let's do it. Let's see if they've really done this right. Here we go. So if I click here, it takes me into the book record. And this book has been digitized by them. And I can click here. And again, it's essentially scrolling through a digitized copy of the book. But it did come up. You can search just the books, but if you're in the general catalog, books will come up if you search, say, by surname. But the reason I wanted to go over this again is that somewhere between half and three quarters of the records at um, family search that are online are digitized but not indexed. So that's um, a very important way to find records because again, it's much faster to digitize a microfilm than to index it. So let me get back over here to the other part of this. So any questions at this point? It's a lot of information. This is one reason I record these. Um, and the best way to get to know how to do this is to play around with it. Go in and put in surnames you're interested in. I will warn you, Smith is not a good one to start with. Don't start with Roberts or Jones either. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> it's just fact of life. Um, Brown is also not a good family to search for. Um, but you know, put in places and see what there is that you didn't realize existed for, you know, particularly when you have ancestors who live in smaller towns. You know, look at the Middleton and Topsfield, Massachusetts, and the, um, as well as the Bostons. And make sure you look at both the town level or parish for England 
and the county level because particularly here in the US, you will get different records at different levels. And um, you'll want to see what um, is there at the different levels. Um, so question, how many of the documents at the state archives were digitized? A very small percentage um, of those that are genealogically related and an itty bitty percentage of their entire collection. You know, the state archives has a gazillion documents that really aren't, you know, they're the functioning of the state government rather than genealogy. But the, they've worked at getting the things that are genealogically focused, the vital records they have, the court records, they've worked at getting those done. Um, a lot of what they decided to select was what's going to be the most use, what did they have permission to let somebody microfilm, privacy um, concerns. So obviously they weren't digitizing things from Health and Human Services in the 1960s because those people are still alive and they're sensitive documents. Um, with personally identifying information. Um, court records from you know, 1870, on the other hand, everybody's long gone and they were able to digitize them. State level naturalization records from before 1906. Um, Maine did some alien registrations during the world wars. Those have been digitized. Some civil war records. So you'll have to play around. Um, the family history books, none of them are directly from us, but many of the books we have, if they are before, if they were printed before 1923 or 24, so up to 1923, they have been digitized either at Family Search or at the other big um, Internet Archive, Google Books, or at a state library or something. Um, and yes, with this move, I, I've told some of you we're going down to a much smaller public space than we had. And so one of the painful decisions I've had to make is that most of our family histories, as in just about all of them, other than some things like um, the silver books for the Mayflower passengers, are going to be going to our offsite stacks where things can be paged. But one reason I did that is most of the pre-1924 ones are online somewhere. And that is a good chunk of that collection. Um, but we just literally will not have the physical space. But what I'm going to do once we're closer and we're close to opening, I'm going to do a video, um, one which is sort of a general walk through the library and one where I will walk you through the process of how to request a book so that those of you who live in the area can request a book and it'll be waiting here for you. So, you know, if you have a family history that's not online because, you know, say it was published in, you know, 2003, that you'll be able to order it and then it'll be here when you come in two or three days later. It's not perfect. I understand that, but it's better than us being closed completely. We're still working on what we're going to do on the family and local histories. Um, I'm at least a good chunk of them will be here. My my current hope, if I can get the approval for the the extra hands to help me, is to have for those of you who've been in the library, the on many of the family or on the town histories, we have two or three copies. We have a circulating copy and we have a library use only copy. Um, if I can get the assistance, we're going to go through those book by book and pull out one library use only copy to bring to our temporary you know, next two to four years location and then send the circulating copy over to the um, offsite stacks. And that way, if you come in and there's one you want to take home, 
we'll work with you to have it sent to your local library instead of you having to come back here if you don't live within a few minutes. Um, but by bringing the library use only copy here, it will be, the, the copy will be here as opposed to this, if we brought the circulating copy, you'd run into the possibility that somebody had taken it out. So I'm, I'm working on getting approval to have people help me do that sorting um, because it's, there's back end um, cataloging stuff that about that. But um, I'm trying to make it as, with the least pain for those of you walking in as I can. <laughs> no promises on anything, but um, I'm working on, I've spent huge amounts of time in the last two months thinking about how this is gonna work. And it's, there's no ideal situation, but I'm working at having it be the least complex that it can be. So, as I said, we got, we're going to have 15% of the open collection space. So, you know, just picture, you know, the genealogy area at the permanent building is going to be about all the space we have total. And all of those other books have to go elsewhere. So, yeah, it's, I am fortunate one of the reasons it's been nice that I've had such good turnout from you guys over the last couple of years in person and the last six months on these um, Zoom sessions is that it made it very easy to make the point that the genealogy collection needed to have priority for what we're bringing here. Because often we have the only copy of a book in the state or the other copy um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing what I'm doing with the family histories is, you know, Bangor has those, Maine Historical has many of them, Belfast and Camden have some, some of them are online, whereas we, ha we are going to be, if everything goes well, our full, the full, our full collection of Canadian genealogy books will be here at the temporary location. And in many of those, we either have the only copy in the state or the other copy is up at the Acadian Archives in Fort Kent, which you know is not convenient for very many people at all to get to. Um, so that's the kind of balancing, you know, when I had to decide, do we, I bring the Canadian collection or the family history books, just so you guys understand the choices I was having to make. Does it make sense to all of you? And that's one reason I wanted to go back over some of looking for the books at Family Search, so that if it's there, yeah, it's less convenient to skim, but you can sit at home and do it, and you can get at it in ways that may not be as easy over the next three or four years. So, yeah, you guys, you know, just the number, sheer numbers have helped. And anytime anyone, you know, I know that several of you have told my boss how great they, you think that the genealogy program is here. And th I'm sure that all went into the decision of giving priority to some of the genealogy stuff. So you guys have been great. So yeah, Nancy, um, I, let me first stop the video. Any other questions about today's topic? Okay. Again, feel free to email me if you get stuck and we can set up a private session. But let me stop the recording.